Jason Aaron is about to usher in a brand new era for the God of Thunder in the pages of Thor number one. Let's jump in and see what happens next, shall we? The comic opens at an underwater rocks and drilling platform that comes under attack by an army of angry ice giants. Geez, why do I get the feeling insurance isn't going to cover active Jotun anytime soon? Up in Asgardia, everyone is beginning to worry about Thor. It's been weeks since Nick Fury whispered something in his ear that made it impossible for him to lift his magic hammer, something that made him unworthy. Stranger still, no one actually seems to be able to lift Mjolnir, not even Odin, the man who originally enchanted the hammer in the first place. Clearly there is some manner of evil sorcery at work here, and the problems don't end there either. Odin, the All-Father, and Free of the All Mother are both jockeying for control of Asgard's people, and it's getting very ugly very quickly. When word reaches about the ice giant attacks, Thor jumps into battle. He may not have a hammer to fly with, but Jaborn, his magic axe, which has, interestingly enough, also kind of gathered a lot of history, what with the whole uncanny Avengers storyline, will have to suit him for now. No surprise, the man behind the attacks turns out to be none other than Malekith the Accursed, attempting to curry favor with the giants by helping them find something that Roxxon has has dug up. Thor is ready to challenge the baddie, but in a weakened state without his hammer, Malekith manages to get the advantage and cut off Thor's arm. Ouch, that has got to sting something awful. The comic ends with the new goddess of thunder taking up Mjolnir, and not a moment too soon either if you ask me. Asgardia could use all the help it could get right about now, and as the hammer says, she is indeed worthy. The comic opens on the moon where the new goddess of thunder lifts high Mjolnir. Of course, it's gonna take some getting used to, and some of the finer points that uh, old Thor made look so easy, like flying for one. Oh, getting into the air is easy enough for this newest hero, it's just steering and landing that's a little bit difficult. But she knows that Earth needs her, so the Goddess of Thunder is on the case. Eventually she finds her way to an old ice giant lair, where a bunch of Asgardian warriors are already frozen, and so are the Avengers. Ugh, geez, they have not been having a good day on Midgard, have they? It's also here I must take my hat off to writer Jason Aaron, who picked the new Thor's words very, very carefully. She uses expletives that would make you think that she was an Asgardian, but her internal monologue sounds very human and very much of Earth. Hmm, who could she be? The mystery continues to thicken, I say. It seems the ice giants are attacking Roxxon for a reason. They want something. Lofi's skull, to be exact, if you remember back from Thor God of Thunder number 25, where young Thor beat up a cult of ice giants who were trying to resurrect their king. Malekith is there too, mainly because he's a dick and will continue to be a dick. Of course, they couldn't have picked the worst company to try and rob because their CEO, Ager, just so happens to be an occasional Minotaur. There's a second there where it actually looks like he's going to fight alongside the new Thor to defend his company. Ah, eh, but he's a spineless piece of shit and runs away. The new Thor actually does a pretty damn good job fighting off the ice giants, showing that she is no slouch in the combat department. However, when her magical hammer gets stuck behind a vibranium wall, it looks like she She's going to have to improvise on what exactly to do. With Malekith yes. meeting with the new ice giant leader in Jotunheim. His name is Scrymer, and he talks about the fact that the ice giants have fallen on hard times in recent memory. A shadow of their former self without their great king Laufey to lead them. Luckily, Malekith says that Laufey's bones have been discovered on Earth, and if that they were able to invade Midgard and get them, it would be very easy using his magic to bring their king back. Flash forward to where we left off last issue, and poor Thor is is without her hammer as it is trapped behind a magical door. Malekith gloats about how he's already killed one Thor this week and that he's not very impressed with this newest one. The new ice giant king ends up eating Thor, but even without her hammer she busts through his freaking head and then starts to beat on everyone who's left just with whatever she can find. Damn. Also, just to add to the ongoing mystery, when the giant ate her, he said something to the effect of, mmm, tastes Asgardian, but with a hint of something else, whatever that could possibly mean. While all this is going on, Malekith has to duke it out with Dario the Minotaur. Huh. Wow, in a battle of two dicks as big as these, you don't really know who to root for on this one. After joining the battle late, Thor says to herself that if all this fighting is just for some musty old bones, then she'll simply turn the bones into dust so that no one can have them. Of course, Malekith, always the snake in the grass, says that maybe this will work to his advantage anyway. The destruction of King Laufey's bones means that the Jotuns will want war and not care what they have to do to get it. But this whole ice giant crisis is going to have to be put on the back burner as the old god of thunder reappears and he wants his hammer back. Thor
Thor number three is definitely a more action heavy The comic edition. opens with the former God of Thunder. For simplicity's sake, I'm going to take to calling him Odin's son now because uh, that's eventually what he's going to start calling himself. So I figure, for simplicity's sake, let's just go with that. He wakes up and realizes he's missing one arm. Huh, man, what a hangover. We've all been there, right? You wake up, you've lost your keys, you crashed your car, you lost your arm. Simple stuff, right? Luckily for him, his dwarven pal Screwbeard shows up with a brand new arm for him, made of black Uru and forged in the same furnace as Mjolnir was back in the day. All he needs now is a fake leg and he can start introducing himself as the full metal Odin son. Oh, but dumb tish. The god and goddess of thunder end up meeting each other on the field of battle and there's a great panel wherein they stare each other down. It's all tense and everything. Made even funnier by the fact that uh, Dario and uh, Malekith are still hanging out in the background, and they don't know whether they should leave or not. Now, because this is comic books, obviously the two heroes end up fighting each other. Odinson says, give me back my damn hammer, and New Thor says something to the effect of, I'll give it back to you the second you prove you're worthy of it. And given the fact that you've just attacked me out of nowhere, yeah, you're not exactly worthy to have it back just yet. It's during the fight that Thor makes Mjolnir do some crazy acrobatic tricks to take out the invading ice giants. It's seeing this that Odinson is really stopped and really moved as he puts it, the hammer never did that for him. Maybe if this woman can work her magic with it, then she's supposed to have it after all. It's at that point our heroes manage to bury the hatchet and find common ground in beating the crap out of invading ice giants. And they do, freeing all the heroes and Midgardians who were trapped in the process. Of course, the burning question still remains who exactly this new goddess of thunder is, and she's not ready to reveal that to Odin's son or the audience, for that matter. However, we can cross old mom off the list because the goddess of thunder plants a big old smooch on Odin's son. FYI, my money is still on either Roz Solomon or Jane Foster, but that's just me. The comic ends with Malekith meeting Dario later on in a secret backroom meeting where we find out that the Minotaur still very much has the skull of King Laufey, and he's willing to trade it to Malekith in exchange for a realm of his very own. Oh boy, that man drives a hard bargain, doesn't he? The comic opens in Asgardia, where Odin the Allfather is epically pissed off at the idea that one of his sons could have his magical hammer taken from him by some woman. He attempts to use his magic orb to spy on this Thor and discern her identity. Of course, he can't do it. Damn it, is freaking uh, Asgard's magical cable hooked up to Time Warner or something? On Earth, the Goddess of Thunder is duking it out with Crusher Creel, who's robbing an armored car. Oh, and this is where we get into the good stuff, because you see, Absorbing Man is completely dismissive of this new Thor right away, saying, Thor can't be a woman, why do women always have to take men's name? Why can't she be on her own, dirt to dirt? Thor was a strong male role model, why do feminists gotta ruin everything? Man, yo, I certainly do love it when comic writers meet controversy and dissenting voices head on. It gets even better that it's Absorbing Man saying all this. Keep in mind, Absorbing Man is so dumb, he has to actually touch surfaces for him to be able to take on their properties. No, seriously, that's canon. Look into that if you don't believe me. Crusher goes down pretty easy, but it's his wife, Titania, who offers the real fight. Or at least she would, except for the fact that she actually weirdly respects this new Thor and all the crap that she has to put up with from idiots like her husband. But hey, all this girl power doesn't mean that our hero isn't gonna sock the bad guy in the jaw. Equality means I kick your ass equally, man or woman. Back up in Asgardia, Odin continues to throw a giant hissy fit. He's mad about the hammer, he's mad about his wife, he's mad about the Congress of Worlds. Basically, he's just mad about everything. So much to the point that he appoints his brother, Cull the Serpent, to be the new head of royal justice. Keep in mind, this is the same dude who once killed Thor and waged war on Midgard. Odinson hits the bar and has himself a drink with Lady Sif. They talk about old times and how their romance could never work out, mainly because they were so very much the same. And then he asks her if she's the one who's been wielding the hammer, and she gets all pissed and defensive. Well, that's another person to cross off the list. No, literally, Odinson is walking around with a list of potential suspects for who the new Thor might be. It's really awesome. Next up, we head on over to the moon, where the goddess of thunder meets up with Thor's mom. Yep, the queen of Asgardi is giving her blessing to the new hero, saying that dark times are coming. What with Malekith the Accursed and now Odin being a gigantic jerkbag, they're going to need all the heroes they can get to fight. 
the coming darkness. The comic ends with Odin deciding if no one's going to take Thor's hammer back, then he's going to have to do the job himself. And by do the job himself, I of course mean send the mother flippin' destroyer after the new Thor. Aw oh, man, this is gonna be good. The comic opens surprisingly enough with the origins of Dario Ager. Turns out his family was violently murdered by pirates at their summer estate. Dario prayed for the power to crush his enemies. In the end, it was answered by a very old god, giving him the power to transform into a minotaur. Oh, but he didn't kill the pirates. That would be far too easy. See, he spent millions of dollars to keep their heads alive, Crank 2 style, so he could torture them all day, every day. Agar is also in the process of inking a deal with Malaketh the Accursed. He'll give him the skull of the ice giant Lofi, but in return, he wants exclusive drilling rights to the Dark Elves' world. Wow, this dude is gonna kickstart Ragnarok and all just for some oil. That's amazing. This guy takes evil industrialists to a whole new level. Elsewhere, Odinson is still trying to get to the bottom of who exactly this new lady god of thunder is. He goes to Heimdall, who pretty much tells him exactly what he told Odin, that even he can't seem to see who she is. Heimdall does, however, say that maybe the reason Thor has become so obsessed with discovering this woman's identity is because he's running away from dealing with his own problems, that problem being whatever it is that Nick Fury said to him in the first place that made him unworthy to wield his own hammer. It's then the comic takes a very sad turn as Odinson is called to the bedside of Jane Foster, whose cancer has only worsened during her time on Asgardia. She's also refusing any and all magic remedies. Her spirit, thankfully, is the same as it's always been, saying that Thor was dumb to give up his own name and call himself Odinson. After all, he is so much more than just Odin's son. He's the man that she loves. Aww. This, of course, sadly means that Thor is able to cross Jane's name off his list of suspects, which, you know, honestly kind of hurts me because I was really hoping she would turn out to be this new Thor. With nowhere else to go, Odinson decides to check in with Agent Coulson and S.H.I.E.L.D. to see if any of have any insight at all into the new God of Thunder. They don't, however, Coulson is able to tell him that Agent Ross Solomon has been on leave for quite some time now, shooting her to the top of the list of potential suspects. This Ross Solomon theory is further strengthened by the fact that Thor is currently leading a one-woman war against Dario Ager and Roxxon. After all, who hated Roxxon more than Ra Solomon, and now that if she has amazing powers, this would be the perfect way to get back at them. However, the comic ends with the new Thor coming under attack from the Destroyer sent by Odin to reclaim the hammer once and for all. The comic opens with a flashback to a couple weeks ago. Ra Solomon is continuing to make trouble for Roxxon in their underground toxic waste dumping operation. Granted, she's kind of doing this one off the books. Coulson and S.H.I.E.L.D. think she's actually on vacation. But when she gets the word that Thor has lost his ability to wield his hammer, she hightails it up to the part of the moon where you can breathe in the Marvel Universe. And it's there that she finds the hammer. Of course, we don't see her pick it up or anything. Oh, come on, stop being such a hammer tease. I've been a very good boy. In the present, Thor is duking it out with the Destroyer, and the fight is not exactly going good. The massive metal brute actually manages to steal Thor's hammer away from her. It's kind of like a really sick and twisted game of magical keep away. No surprise, it's Cold the Serpent who's driving the monstrosity the way he looks at it. Hey, I've killed one Thor before, so what's another? Am I right? They can only hang me once. Odin just doesn't want the hammer back either. He wants this lady punished. After all, this new goddess of thunder pretty much represents everything about Odin losing grasp on his own kingdom, his family, and his people. Odinson meets with his mother, who says that something must be done about this mounting darkness to stop rocks on, to stop Malekith and all their enemies, they're going to need help. They're going to need to assemble an army for war. Without her hammer to defend herself, this poor new Thor is not having a good time in this fight. But bloody, battered, and bruised, she makes a decree that she is not going to be the lady who lost her hammer, or shamed the name God of Thunder in her first week on the job as a superhero. Using her yet-explained magical abilities, Thor is able to gain control back of the hammer and also take the Destroyer for a ride. However, she's not going to have to end the fight on her own because as the comic ends, Odin's son, the Queen of Asgard, and indeed everyone else who was on Odin's son's list of suspects for the Lady Thor, come on by to help out. And I gotta say, it's a great piece of artwork. Odin's son and his newly assembled army of the greatest female heroes in all of the Marvel Universe coming to assist Thor in her battle against the Destroyer. The fight itself is a visual tour de force. I really must take my hat off to the art team here. Just so many different colors, so many different types of combatants all going off at once. 
ones. It also gives the pre-established heroines a chance to size up this new Lady Thor and what she might be about. Uh, Captain Marvel and Spider-Woman have a funny little exchange that I enjoyed quite a bit. The Destroyer is, of course, being piloted by the evil Cull the Servant, who goes out of his way to pour some poison into Odin the All-Father's ear. Ugh, your wife disrespects you. Ugh, Thor shames you. Kill them all, Father. Kill them all. Of course, long-time readers will know Odin is a pretty darn reactionary guy anyway, so it's not like he needed any Grimo worm tonguing to act like a jerk. It's only when his wife is about to have her neck broken by the Destroyer does he decide to withdraw from the fight. Why, in classic deadbeat dad fashion, he even goes, Why are you making me out to be the bad guy here? With the fight over, Odinson takes the chance to finally confront the Goddess of Thunder about her identity through the process of Viking elimination. Truly, she can only be Raw Solomon. Nope, Swerve, Ross Solomon shows up in her flying car and even chews out the new Goddess of Thunder for ruining her investigation into Roxxon. It's with that, Thor returns to Asgardian. It's here where we finally get the big reveal. Okay, now, so this is your last chance to back out, but to fully critique this comic, I'm gonna need to talk about the reveal, and here's hoping our meme doesn't spoil in the thumbnail. So seriously, though, last chance to back out. Thor, the Goddess of Thunder, turns out to be none other than Jane Foster. Okay, so my original theory turned out to be the correct one. Alright then. Now, Jane says that the world truly needs a Thor, but more than that, it needs a Thor who is humbled by mortality. One who tries every day not to just save the world, but to be worthy of saving the world. As the comic ends, she says that she will continue to fight the good fight as Thor, even though her cancer is slowly killing her and all this super heroic stuff is only exasperating things. Well, you know what, as I've been saying for the last two issues, Thor number eight would either go ahead with the conclusion that we all thought it was going to have, or would end up having a swerve. Yep, this turned out to be a swerve, but a swerve that I ultimately enjoy. This issue also did a pretty good job setting up the new status quo for this Thor. Yes, she's allowed to keep the hammer and keep doing what she does, but she will never be an ally of Asgard or the Allfall. I guess now that this mystery is out of the way, the only mystery left, and the one that this comic teases at but never actually reveals, is what exactly did Nick Fury say to Thor to make him unworthy in the first place? Also, with the big reveal of who this new lady Thor as we also have a bit of a ticking time clock put in place, what with her condition and everything. I like that, we never get superheroes with an expiration date. It could be some interesting ground for uh, writer Jason Aaron to explore. Overall, I really liked this one. I thought it delivered. I give it a 9 out of 10. Hey guys, Joel here reminding you that this video was made possible thanks to our many great patrons. If you want to become a patron and get exclusive comic book cast content, then click the Patreon link below and see how you can help us bring you the content you've come to love. Every little bit helps, and thanks for listening.